Hi, and welcome back to They Say It Takes a Village. So on today's episode, we're doing things slightly different here on the It Takes a Village set because this podcast and Circle Cafe have teamed up to celebrate the power of women. Circle Cafe will be launching a month-long female empowerment campaign, which they've called What Women Don't Say. During this campaign, they've gone across the UAE and asked women to submit anonymous stories of a point in their life where it was hard for them to speak up, whether that was because of societal shame, embarrassment, or simply lack of knowledge. What I'm going to be doing on this episode is going to be reading these anonymous stories. Now, of course, I'm not an expert, but my incredible guest, Harriet Mandak, is. She's here with me today to be able to go through some of these statements and shed some light on them. And of course, some of them are a little bit heavy and they do need to be properly represented. For those of you who don't know Harriet, she is a empowerment coach and a rapid transformational therapist. She's also a mom of three and a incredible female empowerment warrior. You guys also may remember her because she was previously on here. She came on to the podcast and gave us some mind-blowing advice on finding your identity after becoming a mother. So if I were you, go grab a coffee, tea, matcha, whatever works for you. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this powerful episode. Let's get into it. Harriet. Hi. Thank you for coming back. Oh, thank you for having me back. Oh my God, this is so exciting. It is exciting. It's really amazing how I feel you know, what Circle Cafe is doing. Yeah. And, you know, it just gets to a point where it was, I want to say it's almost, it's about time. Yeah. 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 So it was just, yeah, I thought, and when, when this conversation came about and what we're going to be actually reading and talking about, I'm like, there's nobody better, nobody better oh. than Harriet to come and talk about this. Well, thank you. And yeah, thank you for, for having me back first. It's always a joy to see you. Um, and a big thank you as well to Circle Cafe for um, facilitating this conversation, but also opening up what is an incredible campaign. Um, I don't know about expert, but I certainly am a big champion for female empowerment, and a lot of um, a lot of that comes from my own journey, yeah. um, which I'm sure maybe we'll we'll dig into a little bit. But um, and a lot of it also comes from my journey of um, that I've been on the last few years, kind of as a coach. Um, I have also studied, uh, I'm a motherhood studies practitioner, which is really um, exploring the social science of motherhood Mm -hmm. and how we exist as, not just as mothers actually, but as women um, in a patriarchal society. And actually there are, so there are a lot of, um, there is a lot of kind of context and um, insight that, um, that hopefully I can, I can share today. But again, I just want to say thank you to Circle Cafe because, um, you know, as women, we do carry a lot of, um, a lot of shame and, um, we need to be having more honest conversations about what are really universal experiences. Um, so yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited to, to dig into this today. It's a, it's a juicy one. It really is. And the thing is what I love, you know, obviously we're predominantly going to be talking about the motherhood phase, but they've kind of covered it in different phases of a woman's life. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. I found it, you know, they've got this now sort of the hashtag, which is say it louder. Yeah. And it's just a matter of amplifying yeah. things that aren't said yes. and why they're not said. You know, again, you've touched on it. The fact that there is a societal stigma or there is a, a little bit of shame and embarrassment. And that shouldn't be the case, mm. whether you're going you know, as a teenager, as a, you know, young adult, as a mother, as somebody in menopause, these are all things that need to be talked yeah. about. And again, I don't want to sound a particular way, but we, I find, you know, we unfortunately do live in a man's world. Yeah. And a lot of the times, you know, the issues that are around women tend to get sidelined. Totally. We are, you know, as, <sighs> As women, we have been conditioned yeah. to be. You said patriarchal um, society. Yeah, yeah, you know, we we have been, um, and um, you know, we kind of uh, we are really raised to put other people before us, mm-hmm. and um, again, this will vary depending on which culture of origin you're from. But um, 
you know, generally in most cultures, we are raised as women to be polite, to not ruffle any feathers, to, um, yes, yeah. you know, to put, you know, to put other needs before us. And, um, you know, that, that is a universal experience really generally. And that obviously, you know, kind of manifests itself in, in lots of different ways. For, for me, that manifested in, um, lots of different ways before I even had children, right? You know, just being very disconnected from who I was, not really knowing who I was. Um, but then what often happens when you go into motherhood is that's just amplified. Mm -hmm. You know, you're entering into this role where you are, you know, the kind of societal expectations are to completely step back from yourself and subjugate all of your needs. So mm -hmm. there's just so much that comes up with that. So mm -hmm. I think, Firstly, just having, firstly, having these conversations and externalizing a lot of what is internalized as women is, there is so much power in that. And I talk about power a lot. I'll probably talk about power a lot in this, um, in this chat because, you know, as women, we are existing, as mothers, we are existing in an inherently disempowered uh, or a society that tries to inherently disempower us. Um, oh, but power, so power can, it, you know, it, it, it is and it isn't because power, power can never be given. It can only be taken. And I think, um, that is something that is really important for us as, and this is what I, what I teach women, uh, mothers essentially really in, in a lot of my work that I do, um, in my group program, um, you know, to really, there are so many ways that we can reclaim our own power in our experience of walking as a woman through this world, um, of being a mother in this world. Um, and that really requires understanding where we have been, where and what we've been socialized into believing, yeah. um, you know, and really starting to question that, starting to kind of unlayer and disconnect and detangle from a lot of those kind of societal messages and expectations. Um, and, starting to have these conversations again because this is how this is how it changes so um yeah, yeah. And that's why i love it i love the fact that these these submissions are anonymous i love the fact that you know it gives you know i also find you know again circle cafe you know the idea behind it you know when you almost you put pen to paper in your journal yes this there is a cathartic yes experience that goes down with writing totally. a story or an experience it's one thing to talk about it but then to actually write totally. it down yeah it's it's amazing so yeah. good job guys i'm going to delve straight into it because i've got so much yeah. to go through yeah. and it's really there's a there's a lot in there um the first submission says even with a supportive partner it's tough it's tough to make them understand how overwhelming and strange childbirth can be after such a wild experience, you're sent home with a tiny baby to look after and it feels pretty lonely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think there's a couple of, a couple of bits in there that are just worth pulling out. Like obviously, and that are worth speaking to the second part, which I'll come back to is just the, the, the piece about loneliness that she mentions, but obviously the, I guess the, the overarching thing that shines through there is the, is the, the gendered experience of, um, becoming a parent and, and the ways in which perhaps our expectations of an experience don't match our reality. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, with, it's very difficult when you are, when you are, particularly when obviously it's your first pregnancy and you're going through this transition for the first time, you know, there is so much sort of, um, so much focus on you, right? You know, you're carrying this new life and it's mm -hmm. like, put your feet up. Yeah. Like, can I get you anything? Like you know, precious existence. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, and it, and it's lovely and it's beautiful. And then you have the baby and it's like, it's you are just forgotten yeah. and it's all about the baby. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, and I think, and again, there's this very different experience that, that men have and, and that women have. And, um, that can also cause a lot of resentment, for sure. um, which, which I'll, I'll, I'll come back to in a second. But I think, you know, firstly, yeah, just under the piece that, that I think is really important there is that we just don't have this understanding of, and we do, we do a really poor job of preparing women for the experience of motherhood and, and what that phase after looks like. We do a really good job as a society. We live in a very capitalistic, consumerist society. Yeah. So we do a very good job of, you know, what, 
what's the nursery going to look like? What car seat are you going to have? What pram are you going to get? Um, also, what's the birth going to be like? You yeah. know, when I had my first child, I spent so much time. I probably read five different books on childbirth. Yeah, like same. I wanted this amazing labor and you know i was so well read on it and i just knew everything and then Do you know, but it's I, also that you want the child the, the the photographer and you want yeah. this and you want to be able to you know have all these things after the birth and honestly i didn't want any of that yeah after having a baby because it you are knocked for six yeah. because there's no preparation there is no understanding of what happens to you on on a physio on a on a every level right on a physiological level on a hormonal level on a um relational level um so you know again we don't give any thought to what does the support system look like afterwards and this again feeds back into the to the partner piece because there is never a conversation about who's going to do what yeah. there's never a conversation about who's going to who's going to do the nut, you know, who, who's going to do the night feeds, who's yeah. going to change the nappies, who's going to do the cooking, who's going to yeah. do the cleaning. You know, as women, we just get defaulted into this. And, um, it's, it's just assumed that, that that's how it will be. Yeah. And so I think, you know, one thing that, um, is a really powerful thing to do. And, um, I don't work actually with a lot of first time parents, but, um, when I do, and when my, you know, friends are at, kind of about to be parents for the first time, I always kind of point them in the direction of some resources to help them with this, um, to really kind of help them understand as a team what what that's going to look like. So um, I'm, I'm sure you can probably link these in the show notes as well. Yeah. But um, the Gottman Institute, yeah. which is a, um, a, a they're a, a married couple and they've done some amazing work um, in the kind of couples therapy space. They have a book. I'm going to forget the name now. I think it's called Baby Makes Three. Okay. Um, and it's a really fantastic book um, for just being really intentional mm. about what that looks like, about what your support system looks like, who, you know, who's going to do what. Another resource that's really good actually for that is the Fair Play um, the fair play card deck by oh, Eve yeah. Rodsky. I've talked about this a lot yeah. on my, on my yeah. Instagram. Um, I have a, um, a masterclass about, about this. Um, and I really recommend even if actually, even if you don't have any children, but you are in a, in a, in a partnered relationship, um, doing these exercises of actually working out like what you are, car- what are you going to carry and what am I going to carry? Yeah. Um, because so often when, I mean, speaking back to this particular question, like when you enter into that, um, that role, you're just defaulted into all of these things. There's never a conversation. There's never any choice. Um, so being prepared for that ahead of time and being really intentional and having those open conversations is, is really, really life changing. And you can do that at any point yeah. as well. Yeah. It doesn't have to be even during pregnancy. No, no. Just after the baby yeah. arrives, yeah. You, you know, at a point where you do feel a bit overwhelmed. Yeah. A conversation needs to be had. Yeah. And you know what? I think that that masterclass I did, I did a masterclass on balancing the invisible load. Yeah. And it was, it was a practical masterclass on how to do that. But it yeah. was also a real understanding of like the massively different gendered experience that we, that men and women have uh, as parents. And what was fascinating to me is I had a lot of men join it, oh. which was amazing. And I had so many men message me afterwards and they were like, thank you so much. I actually had no idea yeah. like that. Because again, this is, this is, this is a lot of what I teach, right? Like we don't realize these things. Like, mm. you know, it's. And it's almost like we don't, we don't realize that it's, it's the obvious. It's the things that we do on a day to day basis, yeah. but it's not like you talk about it. Yeah. But once you kind of itemize it almost yeah. in a list, you yeah. think, Oh my God. It's, it's that externalization piece that I said. And that there's yeah. an amazing, um, I don't know if you call it a proverb or whatever it is, but there's, there's this, there's this kind of proverb that I love to use to really bring this to life. And it's this old tale where there's two, two young fish that are swimming, um, you know, swimming along one day in the lake and they're like, you know, just chatting away. And this, you know, old, old fish swims past them. He's like, morning boys, how's the water? And the fish go, what's water? You know, and it's that kind of thing of like, we don't actually know what we are swimming around in, right? We don't, we are so bathed in these, beliefs and societal because that's just what we've always known um so until we get to a point where we choose to actually bring that to light and bring those invisible you know as women 
And as mothers, there are so many invisible factors that impact your enjoyment of motherhood or impact your, um, you know, your sense of self. And until we actually make a conscious choice to look at those and pull them apart and question them and go, do these actually serve me? Are these actually, do these actually feel important to me? Then we'll just keep, you know, we'll Going just keep on. swimming along and not, and not realizing. So, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I can't remember how I got to that no, piece, but, but I mean, it's all very relevant because even the second statement sort of making a group of friends to help out is so important, but with more people moving away, especially from family, many moms end up doing everything themselves. Yeah. Um, even if your partner helps out a lot, they have to go to work and most yeah. of it falls on you. So yeah. it, it's again, that it sort of emphasizes the fact that you've got this invisible load Yes, and you have been defaulted as yeah. primary caregiver. Yeah. So you know, it's funny that you've got two anonymous people mm. that are basically the same yeah. thing. And that was what was interesting looking through some of these. There's I mean, I know so, we only got there these is, at, at there is quite very recently, common. but there's, there's so many threads in here that obviously they all, you know, lots of different threads that all have the same roots. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, um, so I think, you know, and, and that, you know, that pressure speaks to modern motherhood, yeah. you know, and again, um, the village is gone. Yes, it yeah. really has. And I think, we are the, we are parenting in totally uncharted waters. Like no generation has had to deal with, um, you know, the pressures that we have had to deal with, like being in dual income families, um, living in urban cities away from our families. And that is before we even start, start talking about phones Absolutely. and social media Absolutely. and the access to information and information overload that we have. Yet often we, we don't actually consider that like so many of the expectations that fall on us as mothers are rooted in a different time. They're rooted in in a, in a, in a moment or a, 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 an era in time where it was, you know, single income families were the norm and you had one breadwinner and you had one homemaker mm. and, you know, we're not there anymore, no. <laughs> you know, yet this intensive mothering ideology, and actually that is actually the, the term for, um, what, uh, really, so intensive mothering ideology is essentially this, um, this, there's all these tenets, but essentially, you know, the mothers are the primary caregiver that they should, um, you know, all these kind of things that we pull out of like, she should be happy and fulfilled all the time. And, you know, she should be independent, but not too independent. You know, she should never be angry, always be fulfilled, cook her children, homemade meals, not have any screen time, you know, all of these different things, right? So this, this intensive mothering ideology, um, it, it came about in the, in the 1950s. Um, I won't go into the, into the yeah. kind of, um, into the background of it, but it is the most present form of mothering in, in today, particularly post pandemic. Um, and, you know, we are generally people are mothering behind closed doors. Yeah. And again, we're a very individualistic society. So that has, that's, you know, again, a kind of, um, an offshoot. Um, of that, that we just do things by ourselves mm. because we feel like we should. That is yeah. not the blueprint. It was never supposed to be you that way. You things alone and you yeah. think that that's what's expected yeah. of you, that I must be able to do things and carry all yeah. this and the family and the job and whatever it might be all by myself. Yeah. And that is my expectation. Yeah. And, and again, where does that expectation come from? Yeah, you know, when you start digging into that, you can then unpick that and you can understand like, okay, actually that comes from my mother, my mother or my, my, my culture or my, or the society. You know, that's just what a good mom does. You know, she doesn't ask for help. She doesn't, um, you know, all of these different things. And again, this is, this is the, this is the work that I do within. Um, uh, you know, my, my one-to-one -one clients and my group program, but really starting to just really kind of dig into that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's not the blueprint. We were never supposed to do mothering that way. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I would, I think I just wanted the point I want to speak to with that question is like, if you feel like it's hard, it's because it is hard, you know, and, and that's not, I'm not trying to be all doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. Um, but you, you have to accept the reality of your experience and give yourself so much grace and compassion. And with that, actually the, the, that frees up so much space to just start to move through things a little bit more. Yeah. I love that. Give yourself grace and compassion. Yeah. I um, honestly, if I don't remind myself to do, I wouldn't. You know what? It's self-compassion is, is the absolute backbone yeah. of 
of your experience as a mother and, and actually as a woman, because again, we are raised to have a very critical inner voice. Um, and that voice gets louder when you become a mom. Oh, 100%. Yeah. It becomes yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so the one thing that will transform your experience of motherhood and walking through this life is self-compassion. It, it changed my life. Like when I started to really become aware of how I was speaking to myself. And the reason why I did this was because I didn't want my, my, I have two girls and, and a son, but you know, my daughter at the time, I didn't want her speaking to herself that way. And I know that if I want her to be embodied in her worth and I want her to speak to herself kindly, I can't just tell her to do it. 100%. I have you to have model, model it, it. Yeah, to her, you, to you know, and that's hard. It's really hard. I'm not just saying you can turn around one day and be like, I'm amazing. I'm worthy. I'm enough. You know, like, I think it's not even just saying the words, it's t doing the action. Yeah, totally. You know, it's taking, you know, steps and, and, you know, having your family see that. Totally. You know, it's one thing to talk about how confident you are, but it's almost, you know, are you doing things that make you feel a certain way? Totally. Are you saying no to things that don't serve you? Yes. These are the things that, but, and it doesn't have to be big, massive adjustments small incremental things that keep you kind of totally sane. totally you know i've always found you know if you give me a huge task i won't be able to do it but if i kind of do little things as i go on when you take a sort of you zoom out a little bit you've there's a massive change yeah yeah and these are small bite-sized portions that i can yeah. do to change my yeah. life yeah totally and i think you can you can say all the affirmations to yourself like every day if yeah. you aren't actually putting in the work yeah. to really change your belief system um and you know there's some other stuff tied up in there as well you know if there's you know sometimes there's trauma involved and that needs to be worked on and processed and um you know with a with a qualified therapist or a somatic practitioner um but you have to commit to turning inwards and and doing that work and and choosing choosing a better thought and choosing to become, a, you know, the one change that has happened in my life is I really like myself. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't always every day be like, you know, and I think this is the difference, right, between self-love. And, you know, I think people, when people think of self-love, they think of this like almost like ego or narcissism. Yeah, sort of, yeah, this, this arrogance. It's arrogance. It's not, it's not that. No. It's, it's, it's a, it's a deeply embedded sense of worth. There's a, there's a huge difference. But you know, honestly, that's what I strive for my kids to have. Yeah. But I think every parent does. Yeah. To be able to have that deep embedded yeah. self-worth. Yeah. What could be better? Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, that does, that does start with you as a parent. And, um, again, it's not, you know, it's not about waking up every day and being like, oh my God, I love myself. You know, I love my body. I, you know, cause some days we do have days where we just don't feel like that, but it's about making acts of commitment to show love to yourself. Yeah. Whatever so, that may, that may, whatever that may be, setting yeah. a boundary or finding a bit of space for yourself. It. It's even setting a boundary. It's yeah. saying no. Yes. You know, that I found sometimes if I say no to something, usually before I, f I would feel quite guilty, but now it's almost like, okay, I stood up for myself yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And that's the self-care piece. And I think like, I know we talked a bit about self-care yeah. on the la on the last podcast. I won't go off on it because that really is the whole self-care thing really sets me off because, you know, it's kind of become this like panacea for like all of women's problems, just self-care your way out of it. Again, like, you know, another wonderful trick of like consu a consumerist Absolutely. and capitalist society that we live in. Book into the spa. But, yeah, book into the spa, this buy this crystal candle, yeah. you know, um, self-care is actually, it's a very personal thing. You know, it is um, incremental shifts and changes and and acts of self commitment, yeah. and that can look that can look like going to a Pilates class. Me, by the way, this is yeah, myself. totally, yeah, exactly. It's guilt for me. It's guilt free time. I'm not. I don't feel guilty being here. I yeah. don't feel guilty at all. I enjoy it. It gives me so much pleasure. Yeah. I walk away with a pep in my step, yeah. and and that's, that's empowerment, by the way. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. You know, and that's you know, doing things like this, supporting businesses that support that yeah. this because it's aligned me. to who you are yeah. and 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 your values mm -hmm. and your um you know we were talking a, a bit about values before but you know it, it is aligned to how you want to show up in this world yeah. and how you want to express yourself as a woman yeah. um and really knowing those things and understanding those things is is so freeing 
It really is. Yeah. It really is. The, the next statement. Yes. I feel we talked about this one, but this one just hits so close to home. Um, and I'll read it. So okay. it says, you kind of mourn your old life. During pregnancy, you're happy and excited, but it doesn't hit that things will change. No more random outings or lazy days. Everything needs planning. I love those chill days watching TV or going to the mall to a new restaurant. But with a baby, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I mean, I could literally spend the entire episode talking about this. Mm. I remember with Lace, um, he was my first, obviously. Mm. Um, he was born and I was like, okay, this is hard. <laughs> it's harder than I ever, mm. ever thought. And I knew having kids were, was difficult. But then I kept holding on month by month thinking, I'm going to get my life back. Mm. Okay, we're going to hit the three month mark. I'm going to get my life back. Mm. No, no, six months, he's going to start eating. I'm going to get my life mm. back. Six years later, my life never came back. It's yeah. a completely different life. It's changed. It's changed. Yes. But again, I kind of looked at, I, I didn't have a lot of friends at the time who had babies. Yeah. My sister had, and I was really quite cr cross with her. I was mm. like, why didn't you tell me? Yeah. Why didn't you tell me that this will never happen again? Yeah. You know, why didn't you tell me that I just can't go out and have breakfast with my girlfriends? Mm. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had breakfast with my girlfriend since. But yeah. we've, we've made other plans yeah. to suit or we've brought the kids along. Yeah. It, it's not that it's, again, it's not doom and gloom. It changes. Yeah. But your old life yeah. is no longer what it used yeah. to be. Yeah. And I think, again, there's two things there that I want to pull out. One is that freedom piece, yeah. right? And I think, you know, one of the reasons why um, I de people struggle with identity loss I, I don't ever talk about identity loss I don't like to talk about it as identity because you're not losing anything you are evolving it is a transition um it's hard to see that it is hard to see it of course because again we are conditioned by our society to be very individualistic so we mm -hmm. are very attached to who we are and what we do and um to have a strong sense of self and the other you know, so, so the one piece of that is then you enter into this realm of motherhood where you've got no context for it. And you're, again, there's this like insidious kind of belief that you actually, to be a good mum, you have to step back from yourself. So you've got these two like sides of you that are just like almost warring with each other. And that's where a lot, sometimes that, that real chasm comes from of like, I don't recognize this person that I am now. And I miss that person that I was. And Oh, it's hard. It is hard. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, like the, the, the free, the, the freedom piece is, is a real struggle because again, we are very often, um, kind of grown up to believe that our success is achieved through doing well at school and doing well in college, doing well at university and getting a good job. Mm -hmm. And then you know, you come into motherhood and you don't have the same outputs. Mm -hmm. And generally we all, you know, we all feel, and the, one of the, the main reasons that I see like sort of high achieving women struggle in motherhood is because of this lack of control yep. and this lack of freedom. Yep. You know, we, we thrive when we're in control and there is motherhood is like a lesson in, in no control. A hundred percent. And I, I've, I think I've said it, but you know, it's one of those things that, you know, again, you prepare for everything and then you kind of plunge head first, yeah. having no clue yeah. what to do. Yeah. And, and cause we thrive when we know what we're doing and we like to get stuff done. And again, that is just, you've got so many moving parts that are totally out of your control in motherhood. And, you know, the, we like to live in certainty. You know, I think that's like a lot of the other thing that I, you know, I, 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 I see and I, and experience a lot, right. It's like we kind of live in this all or nothing black or white thinking and there is so much gray in motherhood. There is so much complex complexity and there's so much nuance and so much unknown. And that is really, really difficult. So, you know, I think firstly, just in terms of that lack of control and that lack of freedom piece, even saying that out loud and acknowledging that is really empowering. And again, having the grace and compassion to understand this is part of the experience. Mm. It's not you. Yeah. You are not failing. You are not lost. You are just evolving. Mm. And it's okay to sit in this space of not knowing. Yeah. And how can you sit in that space of not, of not knowing? I think that's, that's it. Yeah. How can you sit there? 
It's uncomfortable. Yeah. And if you don't have the tools and you don't know how to, it, it becomes almost a bit destructive. Yeah. yeah. And that's the scary part yeah. because to be able to be comfortable to sit in a place where you're really unsure, yeah. never been there before, yeah. super uncomfortable. It's not yeah. easy. And this is where, and this is where and why, yeah. like people, people should like reach out for help. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You know, and I think like it's, I, I really, you know, the one, well, uh, many things I would wish actually for new moms, but I really would wish a lot of moms reached out for help sooner and understood that it's totally normal and um, there's no shame in that. Don't wait till the point where you are breaking um, to reach out for help, you know, because we don't actually, you know what? None of us have these tools. We didn't grow up with them. We weren't taught them at school. We weren't given this education. We weren't told in NCT what, what to expect. You know, we are on our own. And in any other sphere of your life, you would go for help. Absolutely. If you had a pain in your shoulder, you would go to a physiotherapist. Yeah. If you were sick, you'd go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Like, we, yet we sit there and we're like, this is me. This is me. Something's wrong with me. I'm not enough. I'm not doing enough. I'm just not cut out for this. Um, and we're all doing the same things, by the way. We're That's all the sitting we, there spiraling in the same thoughts. Yeah. It's kind of like each individual house is spinning, but then that's also kind of mirrors and circles back to what you were saying. The fact that we've lost this group of people yeah. that are around us to normalize it. Yes. So because we are individual homes dealing with individual yeah. families, we don't have, I mean, like I said, I mean, I, me, I had a baby, my sort of very close group of friends didn't have children. But if I lived in a village, potentially, yeah. who had other mothers and yeah. other people with the same experience, you know, to normalize it naturally makes you feel better. Yeah, totally. You think, okay, well, you know what? Yeah. I'm, it's not just me. And I Because there is a tendency to do that. Totally. And I think finding that village is really important because it will look different for everybody. Yeah. You know, it, it might not look like, you know, a mum and baby group, right? Because Definitely. that might be a bit more triggering for you. Definitely. You may not want to do that. Yeah. You might just want to have a conversation with somebody. You, just You might just, you might want to just have a chat for 10 minutes with your girlfriend Absolutely. or, you know, go for a walk and listen to a podcast yeah. or, you know, so I think again, like finding those things that fit, that help you connect to you, mm. whatever that is, um, and making space and time for those. And then also having like some form, it might not be a village. It might be a circle, you know, it might just be four or five people. Um, but that kind of get you totally, you know, get you no judgment, you know, make you walk out of there feeling good. Mm. I always find sometimes, like you said, sometimes baby groups and things like that might be intimidating. Yeah. Because you, there is sometimes a little bit of pressure, not all, but yeah, I think it's just getting your little group of people that, that restore you. Yeah. You know, when you know you what? I think like, I, I will wobbly. happily share my experience of like, I, you know, I had my first child in London and obviously in, in London, we do a whole kind of like NCT thing. So you meet this group of moms and, um, you know, you then like meet up every week and, um, you know, I, What's an NCT? NCT. Sorry, I don't. Do you know? I don't even know what it stands for. Okay. Um, it's it, it's essentially a. I, th I think it's a government initiative to prepare um, moms. To prepare moms, okay. and yeah, I'm, I'm air quoting that because it's preparing moms on how to put a nappy on okay. and how to, you know, maybe a bit of what to expect from how to burp a baby, not what's going to happen to your body, like what's going to happen, what's going to happen to your mind, what's going to happen yeah. to your relationship. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, I have, I have a lot to say about okay. how that kind of is currently set up, but anyway, um, but anyway, you kind of, you know, it's just the done thing, right? Yeah. You go to NCT classes and you, because you want to meet a group of mums who are on this journey with you. And, um, you know, I had my first child when I was 33, I think, yeah. 32, 33. Same. And living in London, I had a very, very intense corporate job. Um, you know, I was traveling around the world a lot and then fell pregnant, fortunately, very quickly and just was thrown into this realm. And I was like, what is this? Like, and I, I would go to these NCT, these meetups, these baby and mum meetups, and I would sit there and I would feel like an imposter. And I would be like, what am I doing here? Like, I, I, I don't want to be here. Like, yeah. I feel, I know I should be talking about like 
how many times, you know, I'm feeding and like how they're sleeping. How they're sleeping. But I was like, I really don't want to talk about this. Like, you know, and and I I put that on me. I was like, I'm just not, I'm obviously just not maternal enough. Like I'm just, I'm not cut out for this. And I think I really shamed myself. And oh. it was a really, a really dark time for me. And and it was kind of in that period I, we moved here um about five months after my first daughter was born. And then actually that process of basically being by myself. Uh, cause I knew nobody here. My husband went to what we landed and my husband went to work the next day. Um, actually that process of being by myself was what forced me to really understand like what kind of mom I wanted to be, what was triggering me, what I needed to heal. Mm. Um, so yeah, I've gone off on a tangent again, which no, I love to do, sort of like but drown out the noise and really focused in totally. What you and I think, and again, I think that lack of control that I think you feel and that lack of that, that sense of, I don't know who I am anymore is so, normal um you know so don't don't sit there and put it on you absolutely you know it is um you know so many of these things are just wider societal expectations um and they place the blame on us as women and actually it there is no blame here absolutely yeah. this kind of also again has a very common thread um instantly loving your baby doesn't always happen mm. As a new mom, you may feel shocked and guilty for not falling in love right away. It gets better when your baby smiles at you at around six weeks in. That's when you feel, okay, you might be doing, you might, sorry, that's when you feel you're okay doing all the diaper duty. Mm. But it's that whole point of, you know, this magical experience. Yes. The baby's born yeah. and it's the greatest thing yeah. that's ever happened. Yeah. Women feel so guilty yeah. about the fact that that, may not happen yeah and again that's that's these unrealistic expectations yeah. that are that are sold you know this idea of you know part of the problem is this image of the mother that we've been sold as this yes. immediately perfectly happy fulfilled um you know fulfilled version of ourselves and actually that doesn't happen and you know there is a spectrum of um you know i like to Look, I, I also, I want, just want to caveat, I'm not a, I'm obviously not a doctor. I'm not, yeah. um, you know, clinically, I wouldn't, wouldn't be able to clinically diagnose someone with postpartum anxiety or postpartum depression. But what I do see a lot is because we don't, ha because women don't have this understanding of the shifts that happen mm. when they become a mother. Um, I don't know if I've spoken about matrescence on your podcast before. A little bit, but yeah. So, so matrescence is, it's getting a lot more, um, it's getting a lot more exposure now, actually. Uh, I think it went into the Cambridge Dictionary maybe two years ago, which is amazing. But um, it, it is, it's a term that encapsulates basically the shift that a woman goes through when she becomes a mother. And uh, so all of the physiological, hormonal, neurological, socioeconomical, relational um, shifts that happen when you go through that transition. And it sounds a little bit like adolescence, yes. right? Because it's the same thing, right? And when you, you know, when a child goes through puberty and mm -hmm. becomes an adult, we give them space. We give them understanding because they're going through a huge shift and they're never going to be the same again, right? They are changing on a fundamental level and we give them that support and we give them that space and we give them that understanding. The exact same thing happens to mothers, yet we do not give them that space or that understanding and they don't have that knowledge either. So, you know, I know for a lot of mums, learning about matrescence actually is really, really validating. Mm -hmm. I will link to, I'll give you a link yeah. to just watch a TED talk. Um, uh, it's by Alexandra Sachs. It's like a TED, like an eight minute TED talk, um, which basically talks a lot about matrescence. And I think anyone who is struggling in that zone yeah. would find that really validating. But, um, so I think, you know, when we're talking about postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression, there, there's this, there's, I like to think of it as, a, I'm just looking at this actually, I like to think of it as like a tripod yeah. and I'm looking, pointing to the mic stand, but yeah. you know, so you, you've got to look at it through the lens of like, um, you know, the, the bio and the biopsychosocial, right? So the biological aspects, the psychological aspects and the social aspects, like on the biological front, you have all of these changes that have, that's not disputed, right? We know after a woman has a baby, there's a massive drop in estrogen. There's a massive drop in progesterone. Just, I can never say that word. Thank you. Um, all of these neurological, all of these new neurons that are being laid, like so much happening in your body. Your brain actually apparently changes. It does massively. It changes size, changes Yes, the gray matter changes. Yeah. Yes. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it really is incredible. There's actually an amazing book called um, Mum Brain, which yeah. is, is yes. yeah, is an amazing book yeah, to it read. Was that, up there in one of the, yeah, that talks a lot, it talks a lot, it talks a lot yeah. about that. And, and actually, I mean, I'm, 
really into like neuroscience. So yeah. it is fascinating. It is a real thing. Like, but I mean, the yeah, like you said, physiological, emotional, and then what'd you say? Relational. Social. 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 You yeah. know, so you've got, you've got this biological piece, right? Which is undeniable. Then you have this psychological piece. So, you know, what's the support system like? Was there any birth trauma? You know, is that woman, is that mother being adequately supported at home? Does she have the right support network around her? Does she have anyone, you know, to talk to? Um, you know, so you've got those two pieces into play. And then the piece that we really don't talk about is this social piece, right? Is all of these expectations that, that, that are put on us, the way we're defaulted into these, you know, these roles and these expectations. Um, you know, and, and this idea that, um, you know, this idea that motherhood isn't supposed to change us yeah. is just ridiculous. Like, that's why I hate this phrase, bounce back. Bounce back. Because it's like, why when do we I want to go back? back? Yeah, don't go back. Don't go back. Go forward. Yeah, as, as if your pre-motherhood self is, is the pinnacle of where you should be. You know, so um, I think, look, and again, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I think what 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 often gets missed is by just focusing on this biological, physiological aspect, you're missing so uh, you know so much of the problem mm. and actually what happens is when these three things are interplaying together it's like a perfect storm and you know that that is often what can happen when you've got you know perhaps in that, those those early days and you're not able to bond with your baby or you're just in a really low place obviously when it lingers then you, you are obviously to. going you know going into more of a you know postpartum anxiety postpartum depression stage but um you know i think just having, we do a really, we do a poor job as a society in, in helping women with this because we place so much focus on this. Sorry, I know I'm supposed to tap the table. So much, um, focus on this physiological piece. And the issue with that is that women then place the blame on themselves. Whereas actually so much of it is a societal problem. We are not supporting women and mothers in the right way. Do you know, not even, not even in the hospitals. No. So, you know, you have, again, I'm just trying to think going back. I had the baby, especially first time or second time I was a bit, you know, more open to it. It was only yeah. the, the anxiety hit in, you know, a little bit after I would say, but I remember I did all this work. I went through labor. I got a baby out and then I love it. I mean, they threw the baby on me, but I kind of sat there and there was a picture. I remember my husband took of me. I looked confused mm. and I had, I've got the baby on and I just thought, Oh my God, like, you know, now, mm. like, okay, could you guys give me a minute? Mm. Like this, but then I felt a bit guilty for thinking that. There you go. Yeah. You know, but I was in a bit of pain and yeah. I was like, could you just take him for a minute? Like, mm. let me kind of yeah. get my bearings right. Yeah. And again, you know, and I don't, I think it's all well-meaning, but you know, this, this whole thing, the terminology around it, like, you know, the golden hour and although I love it and it is wonderful if the, the setup is right, but I think it's almost follow the mother's lead, yeah. you know, as opposed to kind of expecting, no, 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 here you go. Yeah. No, 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 here you go. Just, just calm down. Just have a, just yeah. listen to yeah. what she needs at this yeah. point, yeah. because that's going to number one, not going to make her feel guilty. Yeah. There's no shame associated. The dad's right there or even a supportive yeah. birth partner. Yeah. You know, that's, I remember thinking that. And then for a moment, I was like, Nasser, could you just take him for a minute? Yeah. And then he, you know, but yeah. then there's this, this thing that went on in my brain. And I remember it so specifically because I was like, oh no, I should probably have it back on. That, that mm. is what. That should. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and again, it's, it is really deeply embedded, by the way, in all of our structures, in our medical systems, in our media, in our legal systems, in, um, you know, this, um, in our, in our kind of world of patriarchy that, that we live in, these kind of, um, you know, ways and means that we feel we should be as a mother. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, it is, it is really hot. It is really harming us. It, it really is harming women. And, um, it's just that guilt, you know, it's the guilt when, you know, at the end of the day, if there, I find all relationships, yes, there was a baby and you, you grew that baby within you, mm. but relationships have their own way of forming. Totally. And it looks so different from one person yeah. to the next. And, and I think, you know, again, this, we have these like incredibly rigid expectations, right? About motherhood that we should enter motherhood and be suddenly entirely fulfilled. You know, 
I find it really odd actually, like how any, you know, no, you couldn't do one job for the rest of your life and be entirely fulfilled. Yet that's the expectation, by the way, for motherhood, you know, so we have these like, you know, we have these really rigid expectations. And, you know, the, the problem is that the problem is not that when we enter motherhood, it changes us. The problem is that our society expects it not us, it not to. And we put on mothers what are actually broader societal issues and mothers accept them and internalize them as their problem. And this is where mum guilt comes from, right? This is a whole other podcast. I know. That, so I won't go into mum guilt, but um so much of mum guilt is just is is um societal expectations that we've inhaled and taken on as our own. Um and you release mum guilt by just really doing all of those things, right? Working out who am I, what's important to me, what boundaries do I need to set, where um where do I need to be at this point in my life? Um so yes, I think back to the, you know, the original question again, like just so much grace and so much compassion for what you are going through is so normal. Yeah. Um, and if you need help, reach out for help. Yeah. 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 That's the best part. Yeah. Reach out. There's yeah. lots of people there to help yeah. and are willing to. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Again, another very related um, statement. I cried a lot in the first month, feeling vulnerable, dealing with stitches and diapers, plus being super tired. It's like pulling an all nighter every single night. Um, but you still have to be there for your baby the next day. And that kind of, again, that ties into not loving it, ties into the fact that you are defaulted as primary caregiver. You know, this whole, again, you can you can feel the isolation just in that state. Yeah. And, and again, like, what role would you ever walk into where you were being cried at and screamed at all day long and... And expected being, to being, figure out why being made when to, they're not articulating it. Totally. And being made to not, you know them being made to go into a room and sleep for an hour and then come out and then do a load of, like in what role would you ever walk into that and go, I feel so fulfilled yeah. in this role. Yeah. I'm so happy. You know, I think like it, it, it really is just, you know, I think, and again, when you think about those pillars, right, all of those things you are dealing with, all of those things you are holding, like, and what I really, you know, what I really want mothers to understand is that, you can love your children so deeply. You can love this tiny, amazing, beautiful thing you have created, and you can hate aspects of this new role. You can embody contradictions. There is like being a mum does not have to be the sum total of who you are. And again, part of the problem is this image that we've been sold, right? This image of this perfectly kind of, um, you know, fulfilled and like, it, it, again, it's a term, it's called the bliss myth, right? You know, this, this idea that when we have, a, you know, we have a baby, we're just going to be so fulfilled and, mm. um, and we, we must feel so grateful. And, and again, like we have all of those emotions. Yes. But we have all of these other emotions as well. And, you know, like boredom and, sh and guilt and grief, you know, that we, that, our society kind of stigmatizes and pathologizes these emotions as being really negative. And I shouldn't talk about those because I've had a baby and I, I'm really lucky and I'm really, I'm really fortunate to have I'm a baby, so yeah, got absolutely. a healthy baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yes, of course, but don't gaslight yourself. You know, like you are also allowed to have all of these other emotions, you know, and that also is a, um, this is a huge part of the work that I do um, with my clients because it's not actually, it's not actually isolated to motherhood. It's isolated to like, we have all been brought up to suppress certain emotions, um, which makes them very difficult to deal with when they arise. And obviously what happens when you become a mum is then all of these emotions are arising and you can't deal with them. You can't regulate them because you weren't, you were never given the kind of toolkit to do that. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, again, like just having that, that understanding and that, um, you know, I call it like just leaning into the complexity and the nuance and embracing the and, you know, you can feel grateful and exhausted. Yeah. You can feel joyous and bored, yeah. you know, yeah. they're, they're not, you know, you don't have to just feel one thing, you know, you are a human being who has very a range. rich, a full range totally. of emotions and feelings. Totally. We're very complex very beings. Valid. Yeah. You know, we have a lot of nuance. We have, you know, um, that's not just motherhood. That's just the human experience. Absolutely. So, you know, yet we're all expected to be this robotic, you know, 
task tickers and be okay with it. Yeah. And I think this is yeah. another, another person wrote in that said, being a mom is really hard. You see other moms with two to four kids and think if she can do it, I can too, but it's a really, it's a real struggle and you doubt yourself a lot. Maybe she can handle it, but I can't. Some moms enjoy it from one day to the next. And some start liking it after 200 days in. When the baby becomes a toddler, for example, I personally don't know when I fully started enjoying it. I try to focus on the good stuff day by day. I like it when he laughs or when I dress him up and when I see him grow. I don't hate being a mom, but I haven't fully enjoyed it yet. In our society, saying this is considered wrong. Does, there's so much guilt. I, lo- I love this statement. response because, yeah. you know, again, I think like, it is this image, right, that we've been sold. Um, and aspects of our mothering, you know, can be, you know, of course there are aspects of our mothering, like caring for, being with our children, learning from them, watching them grow yeah. can be so joyous. Yeah. But then there are other aspects of motherhood that can be the most deeply unsatisfying thing we've ever experienced, Absolutely. you know, and I did. I remember I did a post on my Instagram, um, probably about quite a while ago now, talking about how I hated the playground. Oh, how I hate the playground. You and me both. And it's mind numbing. And I, so boring. I can't bear it. And and I got such an overwhelming response of people like, "Thank you for saying this. I can't bear the playground. <laughs> playground and play areas." Yeah, and I think you know. Again, it's like this. 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 You know, you can love being a mum, and you can hate aspects yeah. that unfold for you. This is all normal. And actually, I would argue necessary. Mm. And admitting this, it doesn't make you a bad mom. It makes you, again, a very yeah, richly I mean, complex and nuanced human being. Like she said, like saying being. this in our society is considered wrong. Yeah. Why? Yeah, because there's a lot of shame around that's built into mother. Again, it, this is very insidious. It's very, um, the perfect mother myth that exists in our society is, is very, very deeply embedded in our systems in our societies, in our cultures of origin. Um, and so the, a lot of the work that I've studied within, um, so Dr. Sophie Brock is the real leading voice in this. So, so I studied under her for my motherhood so practitioner qualification. Um, and she talks about the three kind of aspects of motherhood being motherhood, mm-hmm. which is the structure in which you do your mothering. Mm-hmm. So your mothering is the practice of mothering. Mm-hmm. And then there's mother the individual. So you have mother, mothering and motherhood, right? Mm. And it's very normal. You can love being a mother, but hate motherhood. You know, you like, I get it. You know, you can, you can love aspects of your mothering and hate other aspects, you know, but there is a lot of shame around this. You know, right? even, even at the start when she says, you see, you know, other moms with two to four kids and they're okay. And if she can do it, I can. But then again, it's that comparison yeah. that's dragging women down yeah, as well. Totally. You know, yes, you may have four kids, but whatever you potentially saw or seen yeah. may not be the reality. Yeah, exactly. And that's, yeah, that was so fully loaded, that particular yeah. And the comparison element is really tricky because obviously you have it on a, oh, no. you know, it, it's, it's, it's on another level. And yeah. again, this is, you know, no, no generation of mothers has ever had to deal with the level of comparison. Like, you know, our parents had a smaller circle and they also knew those people more. That's so right. they knew the reality, mm-hmm. you know, they might, you know, they didn't see necessarily like, you know, they, they, they didn't see on the scale that we're seeing, right? You know, the mum with three kids, like who's perfectly groomed. House and is perfect. House is perfect. She's got everything, you know, organized. You know, she's making organic snacks. And like, you don't she see, looks fantastic. you don't see the, yeah. the, what is, I would very much imagine the incredible support system that she has behind her. Again, no shame in that. I have an amazing network of help. I, I couldn't do, I couldn't be here. Yeah. I couldn't have, have built the business that I built. But then talk about it. Totally. It's not like we're not, I'm not There's doing no it shame. alone. There's yeah. no shame. Yeah. There is no shame in it. And say it louder, right? Say it louder. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and I think, um, when you start doing that, when you start uh, owning that, then that, that, that is empowerment as a motherhood. And that is going back to the thing I said at the beginning, that is when you take your power back mm. in a, in a, in a system that inherently tries to disempower you. Mm. Um, you know, so yes, comparison is an issue. It really is. And we're always going to get triggered by it. Mm. You know, part of my journey actually was having a really close friend of mine who is still a really close friend of mine, by the way, who really triggered me in my journey of motherhood because she 
was very different to me and did think had very different values to me, which I didn't realize at the time, mm. you know, so her experience of motherhood looks very different to mine. Um, it doesn't make her a, a better mom than me. It doesn't make me a better mom than her. Mm. You know, we are just different and we walk through this world differently. differently. And, um, I can own that now. Yeah. And, and, you know, so, but it's hard. It is really hard. It's really hard. And it's yeah. true. It's coming at you from all different directions. It's not just the people that you talk and you have a conversation yeah. with or whatever it is. It's on your phone so close to you yeah. at home. And that's the worst yeah. part of and it. And I would say filter, like, you know, really be really mindful of the information that you are consuming yeah. because anything that is sending you into um, a, 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 t a spiral of shame, you know, so uh, again, like when I talk about guilt, what, what we're really talking about actually with guilt is shame. We're not talking about guilt with mums. Often we're talking about shame and guilt. The difference is like guilt is this action was wrong or this, this thing I did was not great. Like I should, I could have done that better. Shame is I'm wrong. I'm a bad mum. I'm, I'm not enough, you know, so actually very often what mums think they're talking about with mum girls, they're actually talking about shame and shame is actually a very, we have to get out of shame. Yeah. Um, you know, so social media is a, a very difficult tool when, um, and, and often when I am working with mums who are really deep in a, in a negative spiral of shame, working out what their sources of information super are. super emotional. I don't know why, but yeah, it's yeah. true. I yeah. It is, there is a lot of this internalizing it. it it's me. I've done something wrong. And totally it's the fear of potentially, I don't know, messing it up for them. Yeah. And it's that, that type of thing. It really, it is very consuming. Yeah. And, and look, again, this is another product of, of, of mothering in this age, right? We have so much access to information and we understand so much more about how children's brains develop and like, you know, that's all amazing, but that also adds to the, the mental load and the pressure of, I don't want to harm my children. I don't want to cause them trauma. And, and, Yet the, you haven't even gone in to figure out what's going on with you. No. And the added layer of that is we don't have the resources. You know, very often we're, we're piling all of this information on, yet we don't have the resources to implement it. And, and that layers on the guilt and the shame, you know, so there's, it's very, very complex. It's, it's very layered. Um, you know, but it does start by really, it starts by coming back to you. It, it always does. It starts by like, who am I? What are my values? What feels important to me? How do I want to, what are my personal values? What are my motherhood values? What do I want my children to know? Um, and then, and then unlayering from there. Um, do you know the fact that you say that? That will cross, honestly, generations. Because as you say that to yourself as a mother, you start sort of as a mother. You've got kids, you've got daughters. Yeah. They'll grow up as young adults and say that to themselves. Mm. They'll be able to form healthy relationships, healthy relationships at work, personal. They grow, they go on mm. to mothering in a certain way. They'll raise their children and you kind of almost break a cycle. Mm. Totally. So totally. I mean, that is what, you know, that is obviously you why, you know, why this yeah. generation is called the cycle breakers, right? Yeah. You know, because we are the first ones who have you know, a lot of this understanding. And I think what I want, what I really want women and mothers to know is that just the knowledge and awareness of that is enough to break cycles. That's it. It really is. I promise you that. Don't need to change anything. You know, and there is a stat actually that you only need to um, securely attune to your child 30% of the time, which means you can, you know, for them to become securely attached. That's right? a good statistic. You know, yeah. um, it, and it's, you know, this, that means 70% of the time you can be getting it wrong, by the way. Yeah. And also like, you have to get it wrong because you have to model the repair side of it. 1000%. You know, Honestly, um, I think growth is in the repair. Oh my God. Ma massively. In my child rearing. Massively. The only way that I can teach a potential life lesson is when I've screwed up and totally. I have to explain. Totally. There's a module in my, in my course, the journey back to you called the good enough mother. And yeah. it's a concept from, um, a psychoanalyst called Dr. Uh, Donald Winnicott. And, um, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, if you're interested in it, I just suggest you go and Google yes, it because yeah. it's really interesting. Uh, that is actually where this, where this stat comes from. But, um, you know, what he posits essentially is this, you know, you actually need to model imperfection to your children in order for them to be able to go through the world with the skills that they need to deal with this world, right? If we try and model perfection to our children, we're not giving them the skills to be human, in a, in a human world, in, because this world is tough. Absolutely. It is tough. And you can't, you can't, you have to model resilience and you have to model inhumanity. You have to model making a mistake and repairing it. You have to model 
that your actions have consequences. You know, like I shouted at my daughter the other day and it was like the first time where, um, you know, she was going up the stairs and I shouted at her and, you know, afterwards I, I apologized. I said, you know, I'm sorry at shouting at you. And she said, yes, mommy, it's not my fault that you're, that you shouted at me. And I was like, no, you're right. It's not, Absolutely. it's not your it's fault. I, it's, it's me. me. That's actually, yeah. really, how old is she? She's five. That's really good. Yeah. You know, it's she's quite... like, it's okay, mommy. It's not your fault that you shouted at me. Yeah. And it's not my fault that you shouted at me. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. It's not. As opposed to just saying, sorry, mommy. Yeah. You know, and, and because, she, because she understands that my, my behavior has, has consequences. I upset her. Yeah. You know, I, I made her feel sad, but it wasn't on her. It was on me. Yeah. You know, so we have to model these things in order to be able to, and obviously the modeling is also in the repair. You Absolutely. Know, just, you yeah. know. Um, but also, so, you know, so I think, look, there is so much beauty in owning our humanity and owning that we are all like, perfectly imperfect humans and that actually that's what i want to model to my children anyway um i'm gonna read the next two yeah i'm gonna read them together mm -hmm. because they're quite related okay the first one is the phrase we're pregnant involves men to be included but honestly men don't fully grasp the emotional journey we go through so truth be told it still feels more like i'm pregnant mm. and again another submission is while women are busy planning for their deliveries, the baby arranging the house and juggling a million things, men don't usually think that far. Again, to emphasize the point, we're not pregnant. It's really, mm. I'm pregnant. Mm. I agree. Yeah, totally. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Again, it's, again, it's this very, um, gendered experience of becoming a parent. And, and a lot of that will, will, you know, I don't, I don't do couples work, but, um, I, you know, I, I work with, with women to help balance a lot of the, the, you know, the load, the invisible load. Um, and so much of that comes with education and a lot of that comes with the requirement of an open partner, um, you know, to be able to be willing to look at where have we defaulted into these, um, roles. you know, these roles and, um, Eve Rodsky, is the kind of biggest voice in this space. She wrote an amazing book called Fair Play and she has the Fair Play cards. She calls it the she fault parent, you know, because it's like you, you are just defaulted into I these, into these roles. And I think, you know, there's, there's a really amazingly powerful, um, there's amazing power in, you know, being able to, you know, have educate yourself. And, and again, I keep coming back to this word intention, but be really intentional, um, and be open to, understanding what needs to shift and change. And that also applies to you as a woman, by the way, yeah. and where you might possibly be implicit mm. in your own kind of, you know, where you might be holding on to things a little bit too tightly because you, you feel like you should be doing those things yeah. or your worth might be tied to those things. Um, but I think, yeah, like ultimately it's a, you know, it is a, um, it, it does require having a partner who is willing to look at their own gender bias and, um, you know, whose time is valued more, you know, this comes up a lot when I, you know, when I talk with, with women who, you know, their the husband's kind of been at work all day and, you know, they come in and like, you know, all you want to do is hand your husband the baby. And he's like, I've had a really long day. And it's like, well, what, what do you think oh, I yeah, had? What have I done? All you know, day? it's yeah. like, and there's a, there's a very insidious message there that his, his time is more valuable than your time. Yeah. You know, so this, I break a lot of this down in, in, in like the, um, the masterclass that, that I do, which I'm probably going to rerun actually, because it, I keep getting requested to rerun it because it is a, a really hot topic. But, um, I think th those resources are really, are really good. So, um, we'll the Gottman one, resources though. that I mentioned yeah. as well, um, is a, is a really good one because what you need to make sure you do, um, with your partner is that you do have these conversations because if you don't, the resentment will build. That's it. And that, and that becomes, you know, what it is, what is a tiny crack grows into a big chasm. Um, and the, and the further that grows, the, the harder it is to, to repair it. Do you know, honestly, on the point of resentment, I think it's inevitable. Yeah. I think it's no matter what, I think in terms of the, the securest relationship. Yeah. And I would touch wood. I am married to somebody who's very open to have certain, a dialogue. He's really yeah. very open minded despite that. And we had a baby on, in a very secure mm. sort of point in our life. Yet the level of resentment and only now it's kind of waning a little mm. bit, but within the first, I would say three years, I felt so hard done by. 
Yeah. So hard done by. Yeah. And he did his best. But yeah. the thing is, like now, I'm, again, even the way I'm talking, I'm giving yeah. him excuses. Yeah. Again, and it's and it's not it's not it consciously. Sometimes it is consciously, but most often consciously, they're not doing it on purpose. No. Like, no. And it's almost like, you know, it's not communicating. You're not saying it loud enough. Yes. Yeah. You're not. You're yeah. not explaining exactly what you need. And you need to. I, mean, I remember when I had my um my I, th- I think it was my second. I'm trying to remember. If it was my second or my third. Um and it was my husband was like in in the hospital in the hospital and and uh you know the nurses came in they were like you should go home and, and get some rest and I was like I'm sorry like <laughs> you, just have you know me? like it it's just it's so like it's, it's yeah so, you know it's you, crazy you must, yeah, you, you must be exhausted and actually you know bless him he's great but he was like I am I'm really tired I'm gonna go and I was like in that moment I was so angry with him yeah. because I was like you're tired yeah. like you know and, and then you've got this baby after birth and you're trying to feed the baby yeah again and, and it, you haven't slept yeah, a minute yeah you know so i think when when, when you have when you're ha- repeatedly having those experiences mm. um and your voice is you're not using your voice you know that's when that's when it can get a little bit messy um, but you know that's what i told him i'm like look i don't expect you to, and i remember having this conversation and it was about the playground i'm like i don't expect you to go and take the kids for like six hours mm. somewhere and give me a six hour day to myself which would be amazing but i i just want a bit of solidarity just come with me to the playground mm. i'm gonna blow my brains out if yeah. i have to push somebody on a on a swing <laughs> yeah just come with me yeah. you know to have you know you sort of Safety in numbers. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you know yeah, that yeah, you feel yeah, like you've got yeah. something we can have a conversation. You just feel seen. seen. Yeah, yeah. Like, let's do it. Let's go and make fun of the playground together. But I don't want to keep doing this mm. by myself. And it's not fair because mm. I do it every single day. Yeah. And it's that. And then, you know, slowly, slowly. Yeah. It is slowly, slowly. Yeah. You're right. It is. So it's, it's just having those, having those conversations, like not, not just swallowing it and internalizing it it is just you know in a resp- again i'm i'm not a couples therapist um you know but obviously there are ways and means of having those conversations that For aren't sure. attacking yes. you know talking and you have about to be how quite mindful about that very yeah. and and do it in a time where you are both your windows of tolerance are a bit more open not when you're tired at the end of a day again this is a, maybe another podcast yeah. but um yeah. but yeah th- those resources are um are, are really good yeah. um yeah yeah we've got one more okay. one last okay. submission Feeling the societal pressure and taboo around your body getting bigger is already on your mind. Then you start thinking, I'm not sexy or attractive anymore. When people keep pointing out, you look like a mess or, hey, you're big. It just makes you feel even lower. After giving birth, the pressure to lose weight and get back to the shape that you used to be is just overwhelming. Yeah. Bounce back. Scratch. Again, it's this, you know, it's these incredibly rigid expectations that, our core selves should be untouched and our bodies unaffected. Um, you know, they, the, that bounce back culture, it, it does a real disservice because it, again, it, it, as I said, it implies that going back is somewhere that you want to go, that that's like the pinnacle. Um, but it denies like these absolutely seismic shifts that happen in your body, in your life, in your priorities. Like, you know, you will change, your body will change. Um, your relationships will change and that's great. Yeah. It, it should change. And, um, you know, I think again, this is, you know, outside of motherhood, this is also something that is, um, you know, very difficult because we have very unrealistic beauty standards, you know, in this world. And again, social media is a really big part of that problem. Um, you know, we, we have the, we kind of all as women and actually not even as women, actually, um, as humanity, we, our, our biggest core belief that affects us all is I'm not enough. You know, we all have it, you know, how, how deeply held it is will be, will be different for each of us and it will have different flavors and different manifestations, you know, for each of us. But, um, for women, it's, it's becoming a real problem and for girls, right. It's becoming a real problem because we have these unrealistic, beauty standards we have we live in a very consumerist and capitalist society we have all these hollywood movies that are you know painting these unrealistic relationship ideals um you know we we are we're not grounded in who in ourselves and in our bodies and um you know i I do feel really strongly about this because i think you know again you 
that's how you reclaim your power. Um, you know, we live in a, you know, systems operate by keeping people in at the top in power, right? You know, so like a capitalist society, you know, operates by, you know, keeping, you know, keeping revenue generated. Patriarchy operates for the system of, um, you know, keeping men at the, at the head of the table. Um, you know, so we have to start questioning these systems and yes, we operate within these systems, but we can reclaim a lot of our inherent power just by, by just by choosing to take it back and by choosing to, um, you know, live by our own values and, um, you know, say no, um, you know, to, to all of these, you know, unrealistic beauties and, and standards and, and find our voices, right. Say it louder, yeah. you know, like, that is yeah i grew a baby for 9 months yeah. i breastfed a baby this is the way i look i would love the yeah. fact that my body's changed in certain ways yeah. but also at the same time i am healthy yeah. and that's the main thing yeah. you know at the end of the day like you said seismic shifts your organs move, yeah. move yeah i mean i'm sorry but that it is a miracle yeah. what is happening to your body is yeah. completely out of your yeah. control yeah. and the idea of going like you said, back to a certain, whatever it might be. I mean, who, what is the standard yeah. really? Yeah. Who set them? That's, yes. That's yeah. the, the, yeah. the question. Who yeah. set these beauty standards? Yeah. Why do I need to look a certain way? Yeah. You know, that's, that's the part that kind of irritates yeah. me because you do find it. Thinking, and, I, and I think it's okay to want to look a certain way, absolutely. right? Like and I I'm think that is, it. that is important to acknowledge that it's okay to want to look a certain way I mean, and be healthy and strong. But what isn't okay is when it's coming from an inherent place of, I need to look this way because I don't feel enough. Like, because you are enough, you know, and, um, that, that is what I see a lot of, right? This, you know, and when it's driven from that place, it's very toxic. Yeah. Um, and when you come from a place of, you know, this is my overarching goal with my children. I want to raise my children from a, from an inherent place of having self-esteem because mm -hmm. the world is going to throw some knocks at them. It really is. You know, I, I'm, I'm under no illusions to that. You know, um, you know, the world is throwing knocks at them when they're not with me. Right. You know, but I can give them the foundation. I can give them the building blocks of worth and self-esteem so that they have their own tools, you know, like, I think this is, sorry, again, I know I'm going off on another tangent, but like, you know, I think this is something we get really caught up in. Like our job actually is not to protect our children from the world. It's to give them the tools to deal with it. Absolutely. Um, you know, so this is getting worse. This, this, you know, this social media and beauty standards and AI and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's, it, it is worrying. It is. I'm not going to lie. No, it is. Um, I don't have an answer for that, but yeah. the only thing I can do is just try and, um, allow my children to come from a place of, I am, I am enough. Um, so I think accept the changes that happen. It's okay to want your body to be healthy and strong. Be kind to yourself, but be kind to yourself. There's, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. there's absolutely no, there's no deadline to that. Yeah. You know, there's never going to be, you no. do whatever it is that you want to do in the time that you've been given and yeah. how you choose to make yourself feel good and strong and healthy about that. That's, that's yeah. entirely up to you. Totally. And how it works in your life. Totally. Totally. This has been amazing. Thank you. It's a really lovely Thank chat. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me back. I'm going to link all the details um, for where people can right in their submissions um on the circle cafe website yeah. which is amazing they've set it up and it's honestly i feel to do it just to have a little get things off your chest i mean it's yeah. really incredible yeah. their 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 whole perspective the campaign what they want to put out there and i just think that this yeah was so so helpful thank you yeah, for that. coming on and no thank you and, and thank you again to circle cafe you know i'm i'm actually a big circle cafe fan anyway me too. but i think um me too. Me too. you know this is a, a Oh, a, a very embodied, um, you know, having met the women behind it, yeah. it's a very embodied, very authentic yeah. campaign. There is women behind it. There is, yes, really, there is really women really behind it. Yeah. You know, it, it, it is a very embodied, it's a very authentic campaign. I'm honored to have been asked to come here. Same. Um, so yeah, just, um, let's, you know, say it, yeah, say, say it, it louder, say it louder, say it louder, yeah. amplify it, keep talking about it yeah. because in that you're going to make a lot of people feel a 
oh, fun better. Think, uh, there is a huge weight that is lifted just from that and that alone. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Harriet, thank you. Thank you for listening to They Say It Takes a Village. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I look forward to bringing you another one next week. Don't forget, please subscribe, rate, and review so I can reach and help even more parents. And if you've got a topic that you'd like me to cover, please head over to my Instagram page, ittakesavillage.me, and drop me a line.